It's the early 60s, and racial tensions are running high in America. Tony Vallelonga is just trying to make ends meet as a waiter at the Copacabana Club in New York, but when he sees an opportunity to make some extra cash by stealing the hat of a mafia boss, he jumps on it. One thing he doesn't realize, however, is that this one impulsive decision will cost him his livelihood. The mafia threatens to burn the entire club down, leading to the place getting temporarily shut down. Tony thus finds himself in hot water over a petty theft, with no means of putting food on the table for himself or his family. The morning after the Copacabana is shut down, Tony wakes up to find his father, father-in-law, and brothers all waiting in the living room watching soccer. When asked why they are there, they motion towards the African-American plumbers working in the kitchen next to Tony's wife, Dolores. Their meaning is clear. They don't trust them. Dolores is a kind and compassionate woman, which makes her an exception in this particular room. She doesn't share her in-law's prejudice and offers the contractors some lemonade. Unfortunately, the good intentions only go so far, as Tony ends up throwing the men's glasses into the trash after they stop drinking from them. It's a small but telling act that reveals exactly where his sympathies lie. Tony is a family man, and he is determined to do whatever it takes to provide for his loved ones. He tries various things to get money, including selling his most prized possession and competing in a hot dog eating contest. It does bring in some cash, but not enough to support his family by a long shot. So, when a call comes in from a friend of his about a job opportunity, Tony jumps at the chance. He's offered an interview for the position of a doctor's personal driver. With money being tight and no other way to pay the bills, the offer is a godsend. Tony is feeling confident as he makes his way to Carnegie Hall for the interview. Upon entering the place, Tony is struck by the bright, opulent interiors. It's a far cry from the cramped apartment he shares with his family. He's greeted by a black man in a fancy gold brocade caftan who introduces himself as Dr. Don Shirley, a pianist with a doctorate. Tony is taken aback. This is very much not what he expected to see. The doctor tells Tony about the job, an eight-week tour from the Midwest to the Deep South. Tony's discomfort is as good as written all over his face, prompting Shirley to ask him if he is up to the task of working for a black man. Despite his visible reservations, he tells Tony that he has good references and would be a great fit if hired. He knows that the journey won't be easy, and Tony seems like the man for the job. Shirley offers him the job, but Tony is torn. On one hand, he's desperate for the money, and this opportunity would let him provide for his family. On the other, the job would entail extra services like ironing Shirley's clothes or shining his shoes, and Tony's not willing to be another man's butler. He ends up walking away, determined to protect his dignity at all costs. The next day, Shirley calls and tells Tony that he's willing to drop the extra duties if he'll still take the job. For $125 and expenses, Tony agrees. On the first day of their trip, the record company gives him half of his paycheck up front, some maps of the road, and a copy of the Green Book, a travel guide of all the places in the U.S. that a black man can safely visit. After a tearful goodbye with his family, Tony climbs into the driver's seat and sets off on their journey. As they travel, it becomes clear that Tony and Shirley are polar opposites. Tony is talkative and unpolished, while Shirley is serious and refined. Try as he might, Tony just can't get his rough edges sanded off. Despite their differences, though, the two men begin to form a bond that will change their lives forever. Tony and Shirley make their way to Pittsburgh for the first show. There, an issue comes up. Tony's Italian surname might be a challenge for some to pronounce. Shirley suggests that Tony use an alias, but the man refuses to enter a room where his name can't be pronounced. He chooses, instead, to hang out with the other valets while the Don Shirley trio takes the stage. It's the first time Tony has ever heard the doctor play the piano, and he's immediately captivated by the talent on display. After the show is over, Tony sits down to write a letter to his wife Dolores, telling her about Shirley and their travels. Try as he might, though, he just can't seem to find the right words to express the depth of his feelings. He wants to tell her how much he loves and appreciates her, but the words that come out on the page just can't convey that. When they reach Hanover for their next show, Tony goes to the auditorium to make sure everything is in place for the performance. When he gets there, 
He's dismayed to find that the piano is dirty and unbranded. According to Shirley's contract, he's supposed to always be given a Steinway piano to play. Tony tries to get the issue fixed with the auditorium's cleaner, but the man's prejudice gets in the way. In the end, Tony loses his temper and slaps the cleaner in front of Oleg, the cellist, and George, the bassist. Thankfully, the commotion causes management to step in and arrange for a Steinway piano to be brought in. As they make their way to the next show, the car is filled with the sounds of the music blaring from the radio. Shirley finds himself enjoying the music. When the song ends, he asks Tony about the artist. Tony is surprised to learn that Shirley does not know Little Richard, as he's also a very famous black singer, and he just assumed that would be something Shirley knows. He tries to explain to Shirley just how significant Little Richard is to the black community and how he really should be familiar with his music. He ends up playfully asking Shirley whether he is even actually black. His intentions are good, but he ends up leaving Shirley flustered. As they are driving, Tony can't resist stopping at a KFC to pick up a bucket of fried chicken. Shirley, not liking the idea of eating with his bare hands, has never tried it. However, after being continuously pushed at by Tony, he takes a bite. He is pleasantly surprised by how much he likes it. They start to bond and enjoy each other's company. Shirley starts opening up to Tony about his personal life. He talks about his family and his failed marriage and how he doesn't have much of a life because he's always on the road as a pianist. As they make another stop, the duo comes across a vendor selling Lucky Charm decorative stones. Neither of them buys any, but Tony sees that one has fallen off onto the ground and pockets it. Though the seller doesn't notice, Shirley does. He condemns Tony for the theft and demands that he returns it immediately. When they reach Louisville, Shirley is made to stay in a different motel than the white members of the crew. It's a run-down place filled with African Americans who have no choice but to stay there. Tony is hesitant to leave Shirley alone, but he has no choice. As he sits outside his room, enjoying a bottle of Cuddy Sark, Shirley's asked to join a game. He has no clue how to play, so he sheepishly excuses himself and decides to go out for a drink instead. However, as this is Kentucky in the 1960s, and he is a black man walking into a bar at night, he almost immediately gets assaulted by racist patrons. As Shirley is getting beat up, George the bassist, who is there to witness the gruesome scene, rushes to get Tony for help. Tony steps in, and after threatening to shoot the attackers, gets Shirley out of trouble. He is furious over the doctor's careless behavior, and at the same time, extremely concerned about Shirley's well-being. He instructs Shirley to never go out without his protection ever again. Shirley agrees to this and apologizes for his carelessness. He asks Tony if he actually has a gun on him, which the man immediately denies. The next day, as they make their way to North Carolina, the car begins to overheat. Tony stops it and pours water over the engine to cool it down. Shirley, uncomfortable in the heat, steps out of the car as well only to see that they are parked outside of a farm tended to by African-American workers. All of them have dropped their tools and are staring at the duo and the odd situation they found themselves in. Their gazes make Shirley uncomfortable, as he is painfully aware of the differences and similarities between them. Sometime later, Shirley and his trio are excited to perform at an influential family's house in Raleigh. They are warmly welcomed, and the family has even arranged for a feast in honor of Shirley's talent. It all seems nice and pleasant, until during the intermission, things take a turn for the worse. Shirley asks to use the restroom, and instead of one of the bathrooms in the house, he is directed to a wooden cabin on the lawn. When he refuses to use it, the host insists on him holding it in for an extra hour, as he is unwilling to let a black man use his washroom. Tony is outraged by this behavior, and even more so by the fact that Shirley seems prepared to endure it instead of standing up for himself. As Tony rants about it to George, Oleg interrupts him and urges him to keep calm, warning that things are only going to get worse at the upcoming concerts. During breakfast, Tony once again starts writing a letter to Dolores, pouring his heart and soul into every word. The results remain underwhelming. Seeing the letter's state, Shirley tries to bite his tongue, but eventually, his desire to help gets the best of him. He dictates the contents of the letter for Tony to write down. 
trying to capture the meaning behind Tony's original awkward words. With Shirley's help, emotions pour onto the pages. The letter leaves Dolores in tears when she finally gets to read it. The duo arrives in Georgia. As they walk down a street, Shirley's eyes can't help but be drawn to a shop selling perfectly tailored suits. He's drawn to one in particular and eagerly approaches it, only to be told he's not allowed to try it on. The rejection stings and Shirley is deeply offended. He channels that anger into his music, though he draws a line at letting it mar his performance. However, the energy still has to go somewhere, leading Shirley to make a rash decision, landing him in hot water. Later that evening, Tony gets a call from the local YMCA. He races over to find Shirley handcuffed and naked in the shower with another man. Homosexuality is just not tolerated. It is a crime. The scandal could ruin Shirley. Despite his issues with race, Tony turns out to be much more understanding when it comes to sexual orientation. As the police threaten to take the doctor to jail, he uses his charm, wit, and a little bit of bribery to talk them out of it. Shirley is not a fan of the way he handles the situation, but Tony maintains that he had no other choice. The two get into a heated argument over it. Despite their differences, the men are still bound by a contract, so they hit the road and next morning head for Memphis, Tennessee. As Tony is unloading their bags from the car, he is spotted by the local members of the Italian mob. They're surprised to see him working for a man of color and invite him out for drinks that night while also offering him a different job. Tony turns down the offer, but agrees to meet up with him for drinks anyway. Later that night, as Tony is leaving his room, he's stopped by an anxious Shirley. He offers Tony a promotion and a pay raise, hoping to stop him from leaving. Tony is taken aback by the offer and makes it clear that he has no issues with his job or pay and has no intention of accepting the new position. Shirley is deeply moved and apologizes for the previous night's event. With the air between them cleared, Tony and Shirley sit together with a bottle of Cuddy Sark and talk about Shirley's career as a pianist. The doctor tells Tony about his mother teaching him to play the piano and how he used to tour the Florida Panhandle, where he was noticed by a man who helped him study classical music. Despite his love for classical music, Shirley's record company pressured him to perform more popular music because of the color of his skin. Tony, a huge fan of Shirley's work, tells him that his music is unique and special. Shirley is touched by the compliment and thanks Tony for his kind words. As the weeks pass, Tony continues to seek Shirley's help with his letters to Dolores, who then reads them aloud to her entire family. Everyone is impressed by the quality of Tony's writing, wondering when did he get so good at expressing his emotions. Shirley and Tony's friendship keeps getting stronger, and while this looks strange to people, they could not care less. Weeks start rushing by, and it is finally time for the last show in Birmingham. As they are making their way there, it starts pouring down. They lose their way into the stormy night and are stopped by the police. When the officer sees Shirley, he informs them that they are in a sundown town, a place where black people are not allowed to be after dark. The two men are ordered to get out of the car. The officer is aggressive and bigoted. After learning that Tony is half Italian, he makes a racist joke about the other half of his heritage, calling him a slur. This causes Tony to lose his temper, and he knocks the cop down with a punch. Both Tony and Shirley are thrown in jail, Tony for assaulting a police officer, and Shirley just because. Desperate to get out and make it to their show on time, Shirley makes a call he never thought he would have to make. Minutes later, the chief of police answers his phone, and after a quick conversation, orders the immediate release of the two men. To Tony's surprise, he learns that Shirley has called the U.S. Attorney General, who then made the state governor order their release. Tony is impressed by this, but Shirley is fuming that he had been forced to call in a favor from an important contact for such a petty issue. He is further upset at Tony for causing the scene after one instance of discrimination that he himself had been forced to endure his whole life. During the ensuing argument, Tony tells Shirley that he is blacker than him anyway, on the basis of Shirley's posh behavior and lack of connection to his own people. Hurt, Shirley asks Tony to stop the car and steps out into the rain. He has a breakdown about how lonely he is in life, how he lost touch with his only brother, and how he felt like he didn't belong anywhere. The black community saw him as not black enough, 
while the white community looked down upon him as soon as he stepped off the stage. The words hang heavy in the air. Tony is struck by the depth of Shirley's pain, not knowing what to say. The two men drive off in tense silence and settle into a hotel. After the night that he had, Tony feels the need to pen a letter to Dolores, even as he knows he will be home in a few days. Seeing this, Shirley offers to help him, only to learn that under his guidance, Tony has learned to express himself through words and doesn't need assistance. He can't help but be proud of him. The next morning, Tony and Shirley arrive in Birmingham for the final performance of their tour. As soon as the doctor steps out of the car, he is welcomed like a celebrity by the general manager, Mr. Kindle, who calls him the guest of honor and escorts him towards his dressing room, which turns out to be a dirty storage closet behind the kitchen. Despite the less than ideal accommodations, Shirley remains cordial and eager to play his set. Him and Tony agree to meet up in the restaurant before the show for a quick bite. Tony is joined by George and Oleg for his meal, and the three have a drink together. Oleg reveals the real reason behind the tour. He tells Tony that Shirley was determined to change the mindset of white people and open their hearts to his community. Tony is touched by this and saddened by the realization of just how tough it must be to be a black person. As Shirley, all dressed up for his set, makes his way towards the table. He is stopped by the concierge and informed that he is not permitted to dine there. Seeing the commotion, Tony approaches them and requests the general manager, asking him to make an exception. The request is denied, and Shirley is given the choice between eating in the storage closet or going down the road to a bar called Orange Bird, and declares that he will not perform unless he is allowed to have his dinner with dignity. Mr. Kindle asks Tony aside and offers him a bribe to convince Shirley to perform. Tony, deeply insulted, pins Kindle to the wall. Seeing this, Shirley asks Tony if he thinks he should cancel the concert or just walk away. Tony is proud to see his friend hold his ground so well and without a second thought, the two walk out of the hotel. They drive down to the Orange Bird, a bar full of black people, and have a hearty meal. At the request of the bartender, Shirley plays the piano, and for the first time, Tony hears him play classical music, something he was never allowed to do before a white audience. Tony is moved and teary-eyed by the end of the performance. The two have a great time at the bar. Tony has never seen Shirley this happy. As they exit, they are approached by a pair of young men who want to mug them. Tony ends the attempt quickly, scaring the criminals by firing a few shots into the air. He had the gun all along. They hit the road again. Tony's eager to make it home in time for Christmas Eve, but the snow keeps pouring with a snowstorm warning on the radio. Tony has not slept at all and finds it difficult to keep driving. He decides to stop the car and stay over at a hotel for the night but Shirley refuses. Knowing how important this is to Tony, he takes over the wheel and drives them to New York. Before he does that, he makes Tony put the gem he stole from the vendor up on the dashboard as he races against time, navigating through the storm. Shirley's eyes are glued to the gem. Once they arrive, Shirley helps Tony out of the car. Tony invites him to come inside to meet his family. Shirley is well aware that they are not his biggest fans and politely declines the offer making his way to a full-furnished yet empty apartment. Standing there, all alone on Christmas Eve, Shirley once again looks at the gemstone and makes a decision. Tony has a heartwarming reunion with his family, including his children and, most importantly, his wife Dolores, as they sit together on the dinner table. Exchanging details from when Tony was away at work, there's a knock on the door. Tony opens it to welcome some unexpected guests and as he's shutting the door, he sees Shirley standing there. Delighted to see his friend, he gives him a tight hug and introduces him to his family, who welcome him with open arms. Dolores hugs Shirley, and while he thanks her for letting him borrow her husband, she thanks him for his help with Tony's letters. The two share a smile, as if acknowledging that everything has changed for the better now.